Greetings and welcome to another edition of Montpelier Connection. We're here with House members locally to do a wrap-up show of the 2016 session. And with me are the Brattleboro representatives, Molly Burke, Val Stewart, and Tristan Tolino. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Mike. This was uh, a, another busy year, um, 25 committees, 13 in the House, who, who get a lot of work done. Uh, this was one of those years where what we got done was a lot of nuts and bolts work. Um, state government does a lot that we're not aware of um, and doesn't always grab big headlines, but I can share a list later on just what Human Services Committee got done, uh, starting with protecting elders from financial predators and helping protect children and keep them safe. So we get a lot done and uh, we have a good diversity of things happening from our local people. So what I was going to do is ask people, starting with what we thought we could get done in January, how did it end up for you? And if you could start with just your committee and then look at the big picture. Molly? Okay. You're on transportation I'm on the committee, transportation right? committee, and I have been in all my eight years in the House. And we have a lot of variety. We had a lot of variety this year. The main thing that we do in transportation is pass a budget for all the work that needs to be done in the state. Roads, bridges, uh, rail, public transit, bike ped, etc. But uh, I went into the session last uh, late summer. By the end of late summer, there had been four bicycle fatalities yeah. in the state of Vermont. And the governor started, and uh, then Secretary Sue Minter at uh, the Agency of Transportation, started taking some initiatives about how can we deal with this? What, what do we need to do to make our roads safer? These are some state roads. Some of those roads. were DUI. Well, they all were. They, they yeah. all were. Yeah. And, and so I teamed up with a representative, Willem Jewett, was on the Judiciary Committee, and we were starting to craft a bill, or have a bill crafted, that addressed the um, uh, making interlock ignition uh, more mandatory after you know second offense. Well, it was going to be first offense, then second offense, and then my portion of it was to talk about ways in which we can uh, make the roads safer for bicyclists just by um, things like increasing the, the distance that a car might need to do to pass. So that was um, then at a certain point, we split off those bills because it was so complex. And the Judiciary Committee took the interlock ignition, did an amazing job with that. And that bill passed. And I think it was pretty unanimous that everybody agreed with that. The um, bicycle safety prov provisions in the House uh, transportation bill got added to the House transportation bill. And they were to um, have a suggested four foot passing distance when a a vehicle passes a any what's called a vulnerable user, somebody who's on a bike or walking, walking yeah. or somebody on a horse or a person in a wheelchair or whatever. And there were some other provisions of that. And that when that went, to, then that passed the House, no comment. When it got to the Senate, the members of the Senate Transportation Committee were not so thrilled with that. They thought, well, we just need more education. And when we were arguing that, well, you have to have sort of provisions that you can educate around, like a four-foot passing distance. So we wrangled a bit, and we got some of what we wanted. Yeah. So I was pleased that we got some of that, and I think that it's um, bicycle tourism is a really big part of the Vermont economy. And mm -hmm. people look at the laws that are on the books when they want to come here, So for all sorts of reasons, and for just protecting people. So that was sure. sort of my one of my main um, things that I was involved with and following, in addition to a lot of other things, of course. We're all very generalists when yeah. we're there as well. well. As a bicycler, thank you for that work, because I, I've had lots of close calls. Uh, mm -hmm. Anybody who bicycles on Vermont roads has had close calls, and you know whether it's um, bicycles, motorcycles, people on two wheels, or pedestrians will tell you, most cars just are oblivious to an anything else on the road. And I think it's so much of it has to do with just a culture that we need to yeah. change about people in, in motor vehicles need to, to sort of think, slow down, uh, be more attentive. Distracted yeah. driving is a big issue. And in Europe, it's a very different thing if anybody's yeah. uh, bicycled or, you know, been in that situation yeah. in Europe. There's a much more courteous yeah. sense. So that's something. Changing culture yeah. is harder yeah. to do. 
that culture. Harder piece. than passing laws. Yeah. Val, you're on the Commerce Committee, yeah. and you've done a lot of work this year to help boost our economy. Yes. Um, looking at the start of the session and where we ended up, did you feel you got some of the things that you wanted to accomplish done? Yeah, well, uh, for sure, Mike. Uh, for one, uh, job creation from the start has been a lot of the reason I want to be on the Commerce Committee because, or I wanted to be, I've been on it for the past two years out of my six years in the legislature. But um, I obviously our area uh, desperately needs to create more jobs. Um, and so uh, one of the things I set out to do and my committee uh, accomplished, I think, is uh, supporting job creation in Vermont and in our area in particular. And um, one of the things our omnibus economic development bill funded was a, um, a $50,000 uh, grant to the Bennington uh, County Regional Commission and what that will do is it will help Bennington uh, get up to speed with us in Wyndham County um, so that they can get better organized and they can um, uh, get um, basically do an analysis of their assets in that area and that sort of thing and um, get established as a federally recognized SEDS or, um, um, and that will help uh, Wyndham County and Bennington County join forces so that we can work on things that uh, were part of the prior year's legislation to uh, create a Southern Vermont Economic Development Zone. Mm -hmm. And what that'll help us do is create across the bottom uh, band of the state um, to jointly market uh, this, our resources and uh, recruit people for jobs and um, also to aggregate capital for small business mm -hmm. investment and that sort of thing. So um, pulling together um, even $50,000, as all of you well know, during this year was somewhat of a feat, but we did get that funded and I think it'll really help move Bennington and uh, Wyndham County um, in a really good direction so we can establish a bigger economic development district so that we can draw down economic development authority funding. Uh, so another thing we did is rewrite of the veggie statute, which is the Vermont Economic Growth Incentive, and um, that's a cash performance-based incentive. Several companies in our area recently have benefited from it, uh, namely uh, JS Precision and Vermed. And um, th this um, incentive, basically what it's about is um, rewarding um, companies that can show that they've created jobs, increased payroll, and uh, and or uh, help them with capital investment. So, um, and these yeah. were companies that were considering leaving the yeah, area. Yeah, like GS Precision yeah. was considering leaving. Yeah. So and we met as well, I think. Yeah, you're yeah. right about that. Um, yeah. So yeah, we retained both. So those. we kept we kept those jobs right here. We kept those yeah. jobs right here, and this rewrite of the veggie statute, which uh, simplifies and makes it easier for business people to understand the statute, um, uh, will just be a major benefit. It was very difficult language to sure. comprehend formerly. And the last thing we did as part of the veggie piece of the Omnibus Economic Development Bill is we um, put in a task force to look at how we can use those incentives to um, help small businesses. Just generally, so mm -hmm. far, we've supported larger businesses. Yeah. Uh, so that's something we did. Um, first time homeowner tax credit is a really great thing we did. Um, we passed that during the previous uh, year, uh, but um, this year we extended it out to 2022, and um, that's a $5,000 first-time homeowner, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, tax incentive. So that was a very good thing. Um, on the workforce development front, we uh, basically freed up. Uh, some of the money that the Vermont training program uses so that it can be used specifically for work-based learning. A lot of employers in our area and all across the state, if they bring young people in mm -hmm. early and get them interested in their fields, uh, we're hoping that will ameliorate some of the sure. uh, shortage of uh, people who were educated to do the jobs that, uh, that um, are there. Um, and one last neat thing we did is the Vermont Creative Network. Yep. We um, 
Actually, the money didn't come through on that, but we directed the Vermont Arts Council to do something similar to Farm to Plate, um, which is um, take basically analyze uh, the resources in Vermont uh, that are in the creative sector and figure out how we can pool and leverage those resources more effectively so that we can create jobs mm -hmm. and, um, and really enhance that sector, which already employs like 4,300 Vermonters yep. directly and another 3,000 indirectly. The arts creates a lot of jobs. Here arts creates Vermont. a lot of jobs. It's a big benefit for our state. Yeah. It's a big draw. And, um, you know, so uh, those are some of the things. Sure. Now, Tristan, you were on the Ag Committee this year, back on the Ag Committee, uh, but you had a bill that really carried over from the first year of the biennium uh, that finally saw the light of day. Uh, it's quite a process to get a bill through. So, I mean, along with your, your update, uh, sure. could you share a little bit about the process on the... Sure. Well, so tape? I had an interesting two-year biennium in that I, uh, last year, I was on the Institutions and Corrections Committee and then was moved back to the Ag Committee. So, served on two different committees over the biennium. And then also, last year began the process of... Uh, sponsoring as the lead sponsor of the earned sick leave bill which all of you supported and were involved in as well so um and uh that was a big focus of my effort in the first year of the biennium and then uh we passed it at the end of last year and over the summer and fall uh the senate prepared to work on that uh, version of that we had done and also on some of their own ideas and ultimately ended up i think largely rallying around uh, the framework that we had put together uh, with a few adjustments here or there and then that came back to us uh, I'm trying to remember if it must have been February that it came back uh, to the house and then it was a we went through a process of vetting the changes and working again with all of the uh, members of the legislature to see whether we had the majority votes uh, to bring that across the finish line. So all in all, that particular piece of le legislation around her and sick leave and, uh, and some minimum thresholds that we were putting into law for uh, employers, uh, that it was a, a several years, well, six to eight years of significant groundwork and then a two-year biennium with, with both houses uh, working really hard uh, over those two years to, to finally get that in, into legislation. Um, I think which is an example of just how the process works. It, it can take many years and it can take a significant amount of committee time and effort from a variety of different legislators to, uh, to pull something like that across. And, and while it was a significant change and I'm very proud of the work that we all supported and did um, to make that happen. Uh, it's not actually that complicated a piece of, legisl of legislation. So you look at something that's a much more complicated concept and you think about you know, what it takes to get some sure. of those through. This was a relatively straightforward um, issue in terms of the, the sort of the technicalities of it. The politics of it were complicated and that's yeah. what took so long was to bring all of the stakeholders along the way. Well, to get more complicated then, I'll. I'll bring you back to the Ag Committee yep. uh, because the, the, the wraps, the required agricultural practices mm -hmm. were, were just released and, and I'm hearing from, from some folks who have some questions about that. Now there's going to be a hearing in Brattleboro on that later in June? Uh, that, I'm so, I apologize for not knowing the answer to yeah. when that might be sure. um, we'll put We'll put that up on the screen. Thank you, I you know, appreciate we'll, that. I, yeah. uh, but what are the, the wraps? So one of the, if, there has been in existence in Vermont law for a long time um, guidelines, uh, rules about farming uh, that had to do with, particularly with water quality, but a whole range of issues. And when we redid our water quality bill uh, last year, we uh, initiated a, a, a new process that was trying to get at the 25% the or so of the problem uh, with for Lake Champlain of, of the phosphorus contamination and on the Connecticut River side the nitrogen uh, issue is related to agricultural practices. It's really related to the handling of, of manure or handling of fertilizers and uh, the, the, the way that farming is practiced and runoff and all of the kinds of ways that buildings and structures and practices influence water quality. And so 
the agency engaged in a rulemaking process where they put out a draft rule, they get feedback, they revise it, they put it out and again. And all of this is geared towards uh, requiring all farmers, and this has always been true, it's actually been required of all farmers, but to require all farmers to follow best practices for making uh, their farm function in a way that supports the long-term health of our water ecosystems. And uh, it's not easy. Uh, in some cases, the fixes can be quite expensive, and uh, but it, um, we have to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, the bottom line is we have to do yeah. this. Lake Champlain is under uh, significant pressure from the phosphorus contamination, and you have two uh, two parts of the lake that, in particular, are having annual uh, blooms of toxic algae that make the water completely unusable for the local inhabitants and smell terrible uh, in places that have a historic connection to, to the lake. And, and the federal government was poised to require us to do even more drastic and ineffective things. And we averted that and we were approved for a plan, but that plan involves things like the RAPs being effectively yeah. uh, implemented to really make a difference in how farms uh, practice. Yeah. Uh, another issue that your committee looked at that something that seems to be a growing issue and it's about pollinator protection. Yeah, absolutely. So the the pollinator issue is an interesting one because uh, there are places around the world that have addressed the the um, the relative vulnerability of the pollinator population and bees. Uh, honeybees are just one piece of other wild pollinators as well uh, by immediately moving to ban certain classes of chemicals and their use. And we're not at that point in any way. Uh, what we knew we needed to do is to bring together uh, a committee of stakeholders who are experts in varieties of different parts of the, of the field, whether, they're, whether they run hives of their own, whether they um, are part of the commercial agricultural system or, or whether they're pesticide applicators, all kinds of different stakeholders uh, to really work at monitoring pollinator health, making recommendations for better practices that will improve pollinator health, particularly around forage. Uh, changing practices in the dairy industry mean that um, croplands that used to go uh, and flower are now getting actually cut to hay much sooner than that. And so you have significant loss of forage. So we, uh, we know that we need to be positioned in case there's a crisis and also monitor pollinator health and really support uh, changes in that direction without um, necessarily going to the draconian step of just banning classes of pesticides that may or may not be yeah. driving the issues. It's not that clear, is it? That, uh, it no, it's not that clear. I think there are uh, the, the main uh, pesticide class is, is the neonicot neonicotinoids or neonics. I can't remember exactly how you pronounce it, to be honest. Everybody shortens it to neonics. But uh, there, there are many plants nursery plants that are brought in from out of state that are pre-treated with ne neonics and that's probably unnecessary and there is a good strong connection between neonics and pollinator health but they also used correctly are a very important part of a commercial agricultural system particularly in orchard management and mm -hmm. so I think that what we're looking for is how to uh, support uh, the the effective use of that class of pesticides and or I should say herbicides actually um, but you know, that class of chemicals uh, and really focus on pollinator health so that we do the right thing for our pollinators but we don't necessarily uh, make draconian changes to sure. a system that that can be built around effective and fair use of that yeah now we each have our own committees uh, I'm on the human services committee and we have our list of things we've done but there are, are bigger issues we have to be on top of what's happening with other committees and that's why we depend on each other uh, some of the bigger issues though I'd like you to comment on if you'd like um, for example um, other states are um, trying to limit access to women's health birth control we passed a bill uh, that makes it easier for people and, and requires that birth control be provided to both men and women within insurance. Um, is that something you supported? I think we all... Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And Absolutely. Yeah. 
one of the things, and years ago, the connection was made between population growth and environmental degradation. We seem to have gotten away from that. Is that something we should be talking about again in terms of family planning and looking at the environment? I, I don't know if it's, I mean, it seems like it's more of a problem in other countries. Mm -hmm. Um, our birth rates are not that high right now, but but certainly the it brings up the issue of climate change mm -hmm. and the the population impact yep. on that. And you know how do you tackle that huge problem? And there are many many factors that we need to consider. So yeah. I, I don't want to deny the impact of population, but I don't know if that's at the top of the list for mm -hmm. Vermont. Yep. Uh, I'd like to say, I sure. don't think it's at the top of the list of Vermont, but I think it's a big elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. And I think yeah. it's really mm -hmm. long term for the planet, yeah. pretty catastrophic. And yeah. it's kind of odd that we just, it's no longer on a radar screen. It's not. It in, used to be a prominent part it of it. It was that. a very, very prominent. Yeah. Zero I mean, population growth. Yeah, zero Ab population. Absolutely. And, and, you know, Vermont, I mean, we actually have a low birth rate, which yeah. is a problem, and we need more people. But, right. um, but worldwide, I mean, I, I think we need to talk about it. Sure. Yeah, I think part of that shift is actually that there was a recognition that it's less about population and it's more about whether the systems that support the population are regenerative or not. And um, there are many ways that population growth can can happen and and support regenerative systems whether that's in the clean uh, energy sector or in farm practices where um, so it's not I think there used to be the assumption that it was just simply population growth itself that was the issue and I think now we see it as um, that's a that's a sign or a potential red flag but it itself is not the issue it's what it's how we support and sustain mm -hmm. a population that is growing uh, and, and what that means. And there have been pretty significant changes in many parts of the world around that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned how Vermont does have a low population growth. Um, we're also an aging population, and I think there are concerns that we're uh, losing some, some of our younger people. I think the, the, the actual Data, though, suggests we're, we gained a few people in the last year, but uh, the country as a whole is, is aging as, as, as the boomers uh, take on our gray hair and, and aging. Um, what can we do about that? It, is that the role of government? Um, and if so, what, what can we do to encourage more young people to move here? We, I was at, in Valerie this morning, we were at a, a child care conference, and of course, one of the issues that is, is always there is, you know, we have young families who can't afford childcare, yeah. and therefore, or and therefore, if they can't afford childcare, it's sort of like, well, do I buy a house? Do I yeah. pay for childcare? The huge cost of that, and how do we encourage that? We could really encourage young people to come to Vermont if we had better, some subsidized childcare, not only for low-income people, but for for, for everybody, professional now, people who are professional. Um, Jobs. Somebody in Quebec you knew? Was it your daughter? A uh, friend of my daughter's yeah. um, lives in, in Montreal, yeah. has two children, uh, got a year's maternity leave for each child, and now pays $11 a day per child for childcare. Subsidized, yeah. excellent childcare. Yeah. And that's because that province believes that they want to have more children, they want to populate. and. What an incentive. Sure. Um, and people say, well, how can you afford it? Well, how can we afford to you know, be losing children in our schools? Sure. And how can we afford to be an aging population without a, well, you know, the people coming yeah. along who are going to be able yeah. to pay the taxes Talk to sustainable. Con continue? So it's, it's really, I mean, I've thought you know, in the past, and, and after being at this event this morning, I thought, you know, we really need to come up with at least start that conversation about better, you know, subs better subsidies for childcare, mm -hmm. and uh, which is not to, you know, there's a lot that's been done, as you pointed out with your committee, a lot that's been done to help out people who are uh, in need of childcare, but it needs to be much more comprehensive. Sure. And what we know about brain development now, it's not just right. childcare, it's, it's the early education and care, uh, that those first five years are essential. Um, what do you see as... Um, well, if I could just say on that sure. very point, Mike, and they showed a chart today, and 
the, the best investment was during the early years. Yeah. So it's really um, an investment that pays off for a state and actually has long-term detrimental uh, consequences if there isn't sufficient. I think it was 70% of you know Vermont children do not have. And when you go to the infant and the toddler age, it's like high quality childcare. It's just yep. such a small proportion. And then the readiness for school. I mean, it really affects right. that. So and then you have to hire more people to deal with special ed issues and things that could have been taken care of much earlier. Exactly. So yeah. it becomes much more uh, cost prohibitive. But one thing um, on the economic development front, speaking of losing population, that we wanted to do as a committee and uh, did uh, succeed in securing $200,000 last year uh, so that we could get a branding company uh, uh, and a place-based advertising company, two companies we ended up hiring to conduct research on how we can attract young people to the state, how we can keep young people here and also how we can attract businesses and they did um, you know all kinds of interviews a hundred different you know companies and organizations and universities and that sort of thing in the state and now they're working on a uh, specific a marketing uh, they actually have a marketing plan it's a three-year marketing plan and one of the very goals is to keep people here, grow jobs here, but also attract people from other states. Yep. So um, I think that's one thing we're doing to address Great. that, that yeah. need. Tristan. Yeah, you... well, so there's a lot there that I agree with um, and, and don't need to repeat, but I actually think I would like to shift the, the frame a little bit because um, we have our most recent unemployment numbers uh, support the fact that uh, that actually it's not jobs that we need so much as it is workers. And, right. uh, and you know, common wisdom, if you talk to a lot of people who don't pay attention to it but just sort of feel anxious about the economy, you know, they'll say, we need more jobs. And you know, I'm not saying we don't want more jobs. No, <laughs> let's bring them in. Let's continue to, to work on that. Um, but the fact is that there are thousands of job openings currently uh, uh, available for people that we are having trouble filling, and these are skilled, trained jobs. Uh, though, everything right? across yeah. the board, from very high skill, high pay jobs to entry level positions, um, we have openings in every sector, in every category of employment in various parts of the state, and in a in a environment where we um, had access to a. A, a sort of a deeper labor pool of available labor, we would probably fill those jobs with young people and with immigrants. And uh, Vermont doesn't have enough immigration from outside of the mm -hmm. country. Uh, outside of the Burlington area, where um, we have very little uh, of uh, uh, foreign-born immigrants who are often people who fill entry-level positions. And uh, outside of the Burlington area, we have a hard time recruiting and retaining young people to live. Uh, and stay, either stay or, or come and, and, and chase those jobs. And, and part of it, I think, has to do with housing. Yeah, uh, yeah. big piece, I think. That um, many of the economic hubs outside of the Burlington area, and actually Burlington area itself also has the same problem. Uh, the vacancy rate in apartment uh, for rental housing is, is uh, in the 1% range, which yeah. it means that if you are looking, if you're graduating from college and you're looking to figure out where you want to go, it's awfully hard to take an entry level position uh, if you don't know that you can find a place to live. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so we have, that's a real concern to me. Um, unfortunately, it's the kind of problem that it's, it's not obvious that it's government's responsibility to fix it and or that it has the capacity to fix it. Yeah. It's also pretty clear that that the private sector, that there's a market failure in the private sector hasn't fixed it either. Yeah. So it's one of those things we have to look at what kind of public private partnership can actually move the dial on this particular issue. And I think that if we can get to that, we can start to shift some of the demographic problems. Um, and then I'll say one plug, speaking as somebody who has spent three of the last four years on the Agriculture Committee um, and knowing uh, a little bit about the millennial generation in particular that's very values driven. This is a generation that is known to be 
uh, participating in service work at a higher level than any generation prior. Um, they, they're really motivated by the environment, by health. Uh, are Vermont's leadership in the local food movement and really a values-based approach to, to business and to community is deeply attractive to millennials. The issue isn't whether they think it's going to be fun or interesting to be here. The issue is, is that once they've spent some time somewhere else, found a partner, a life partner, uh, that it's hard for them economically to get back here because they want to be here. Yep. Vermont is a beacon for yeah. them. Uh, so, uh, and I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing for people to, to leave Vermont for a few years and then come back with skills and new knowledge and hopefully new people that they're bringing back to the state with them in tow and to start a family. So it's just we have to figure out how, um, how we can all work together to break down those barriers. Yeah, and, right. and, the, and, and the immigration issue is, is very real too. Yep. We are, um, uh, that it is not, to, to sort of put it bluntly, it is not uh, sort of the aging traditional white American rural population that is where the growth is in, in communities. Yep. It's in people from other parts of the world moving in, in particular, that have been really important economic drivers in many regions of the country. And we simply have very little of it outside of Burlington. Well, I know talking to people in other states and in Quebec, what they've been doing is they've been doing targeted immigration, actually outreach to mm -hmm. minority populations. And I know Curtis Reed has talked about this Absolutely. locally, that that's where the growth is. And I agree, diversified small agriculture has been very attractive, and that's where a, a growth part, uh, a lot of young people coming to Vermont, or it's keeping them here. Um, in closing, uh, maybe we can go around and talk about what we'd like to do. We're all running for re-election hoping to get back in with a new administration. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is frame it the way former Representative Mike Obahusky used to. When he thought about what we were doing, he would ask, so how is this going to help Mrs. Murphy down the street? And the thing I'd like to talk about, uh, there's two things. That we need to look out for our elders more than we're doing. Early education, take care of the disabled in our, in our, in our communities. Uh, housing, I think. At every demographic level, uh, this is, you mentioned private partnership, uh, private public mm -hmm. partnerships. I think it's going to be essential. I think this helps Mrs. Murphy if she wants to get out of her big old house, have some place to go that we do need more. Working with the, through the VHCB with the local housing trusts, I think this is an issue that we, we really need to, to look forward to next year. And I think it's, you know, our work's cut out for us. Molly? Well, I, I think about transportation, and um, uh, several years ago, the um, AARP um, had a conference called Transporting the Public and found out that people who were aging really wanted to be able to continue to get around. They did not want to be isolated, and it's particularly challenging in the state because we have you know, a dispersed population. And uh, so my interest is in promoting a variety of different forms of transportation to help people get around, people who are low income and maybe can't afford a car, or people who don't want to have a car because they want to spend their money on other things. So that's sort of, I think, if I'm thinking about a particular person, what can I do in my committee to sort of help to make a difference on the ground yeah. there? So I think that's one answer to your question. There, sure. there are many others, yeah. too, because there are many other things that we deal with every yeah, day that, exactly. that we're involved with. And it's not just that we're focused on the work of our committee, but in terms of that specific topic, yes. Yeah. So uh, mine would be uh, workforce development in terms of, as Tristan was mentioning, it is true. We do have like 4,000 jobs currently in the state that we don't have people that are uh, educated or skilled enough to fill. Um, so is con continuing to work on workforce development and um, figuring out a way to use our career and technical centers more effectively um, to uh, train people for the jobs that we have. Um, also to figure out a way to bridge where the jobs are and where the people are because that's another big statewide yeah. problem yeah. that I think we need to uh, work on. Um, and the only thing I want to say about um, housing, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and um, I'm very interested in exploring this tiny house movement as a possible uh, way to house 
um, elders and homeless and others. Um, they've actually, um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the tiny house idea, but you know, just really houses that are minimal size and um, and very affordable to build. And they actually have some projects in uh, Eugene, Oregon, Hawaii, and um, New Hampshire mm -hmm. that are elder micro housing projects. Mm -hmm. So I want to explore that as an affordable yeah. way to house people who housing is not attainable or yeah. um, for elders and other people that we need to uh, figure out how to accommodate as a as a yeah. society. Sounds so, promising. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and there's, um, there's going to be a festival on September 4th called the Tiny House Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be a festival right here in Brattleboro. Oh, great. It'll be interesting to yeah. explore that idea. So uh, there's so many things <laughs> that I'm thinking about and, uh, that we didn't talk about or that are, are going to continue to be an issue. Obviously, the housing question is, is going to be on my mind and, and I think on all of our minds. Uh, I want to pick up on something that Valerie just said, which is that... Um, or sort of go extend in a different direction, but we have the one of the best four-year high school graduation rates in the country, um, mm. but then we do not very well post-graduation. And uh, in fact, many, I think it's close to 60% of our high school graduates uh, don't actually get a four-year college degree, and they're part of the workforce. And um, I think I guess I would argue that, that we need to be smarter, culturally smarter, about supporting uh, real work to workforce training and development uh, that is not um, necessarily, uh, doesn't preclude the idea of going to college, but maybe we give more stops along the way. And give an example, you know, I think if somebody coming out of high school can get started in a, having picked up in high school some of a certain set of skills, say culinary, which is my background, um, you know, at, if they come out of high school with some good culinary skills, get hired, then partway through the first couple of years of their work, they go to culinary school, get an associate's degree. Then they might go continue, get a business degree, a uh, bachelor's, you know, that, that, each step of the way, there's a reason for them to continue that's consistent with the professional work path that they're on. And this works uh, in many, many sectors of our economy. And to be honest, part of the reason why these jobs aren't getting filled is that, that we are telling too many kids get the message anyway that, that if they can't thrive in a four-year college experience or don't get themselves to college, that they are not going to be able to have uh, uh, a lifelong kind of learning plan related to work and that's not true and it can be that college plays a role in that and we may pick them up later in college sure. but there's nothing wrong with us really focusing on giving people actually skills in in a career path and then support them in that career path and that's a, it's a, a cultural shift that that isn't anti-college um, but is actually consistent with the reality that people, many people need, um, need to work yeah. sooner and then, and then they often don't get any more advanced training and then they're sort of stuck in the entry level positions when, they, yeah. when there's a demand for them to get more skill, tra uh, skill sure. training and we haven't supported that. So that's a priority for me. Yeah. And right down the street from where we are right now, it's happening with Vermont Technical College with CCV. Those are options. I think another piece we need to look at, though, uh, I have a nephew that just graduated from college, and he feels lucky that he only has $50,000 mm -hmm. in debt. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, yeah. people going on to graduate school, uh, uh, I think that's something we need to look at as a nation, as a state. Uh, the, the cost of college has just become exorbitant and, and mm -hmm. pricey. I, I will say uh, I'm a trustee of, the UV, of UVM, yeah. and uh, our four-year cost, actual true cost to our students is is lower than our peer group, mm -hmm. and uh, I think the state colleges also do an excellent job. So in state, yep. I think we have excellent opportunities in our uh, sort of public system 
to graduate with an undergraduate degree with a reasonable debt burden. In fact, many Vermonters at UVM don't pay any tuition at all. I think 40 or 50 percent mm -hmm. of the Vermonters who attend UVM don't pay mm -hmm. any tuition at all. Yeah, that's great. Um, but abs you know, but as a sort of larger so social issue, I 100 percent agree with you. I just yeah. put a plug in there for the, all of the high quality CCV, Vermont Tech, the yep. state colleges, and UVM. We have a, a wonderful system here, and uh, and it's it often can support starting your life with lower debt. Yeah. And we put a little money this year, as you all know, into the Vermont State Colleges in terms of uh, funding scholarships. So I think I think we're really aware on the yeah. Vermont legislature, we have to do better. It's just mm -hmm. where to find the money. Yeah. And the economic advantage of having CCV and yeah. Vermont Tech right downtown, right downtown. In, in the Brooks House. It's just such a wonderful story. Very fortunate. Well, it's another, really great. another hats off to the governor, because no he question. has right. a lot to do. And, and Martha sure. O'Connor, who's the chair of the Vermont yeah. State exactly. College Board, was a very yeah. strong advocate And all for the, the investors who took lots of risks on that yeah. project. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you all taking the time out and uh, coming in talking. We look forward to as the summer goes on and we move into election season, we'll talk with you some more. And we want to thank everybody here at BCTV too, uh, throughout the session and uh, before, now after, uh, BCTV has helped bring the work of the legislature in Montpelier here to you and uh, hopefully helps make our jobs mo more effective and, and more responsive to you. So thanks to BCTV. And thanks to you for tuning in. Until next time, this is Representative Mike Merwicki from Putney. Bye-bye now.